morning and welcome to worship at Heritage Fellowship. We're so glad that you've joined us today. We hope you had a happy Thanksgiving and we're looking forward to this Advent season, even though everything's different for all of us right now in the middle of this pandemic. There's nothing like a holiday season to really bring us out of a place. And what a better time to consider the light of the world coming into this darkness than in the darkness in which we find ourselves right now. And so I believe that this Advent season will take on new meaning as we look back to the story of Christ coming to this world for us and we look forward to what's next for us. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. Silently and gently. Falling and failing. Changing and resting. Seeking you, Lord. We watch. We wait. We dream. We pray. For the earth to renew. For our hearts to soften. For your grace to cover us. For your justice to pour out. For time and space to listen. For courage to act. On the edge of Advent, we sit with you. We pause. We hurt. We repent. We rage. When will it be? Will it ever be? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. If ever there was a year that we needed Advent, this is the year. We hardly know how to describe the year we have lived through. We hesitate to reflect on all the mess around us in 2020. All we know is that nothing seems right. Nothing seems like it used to be. Nothing. We need Advent. The prophet Isaiah cried out for us, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down to make your name known so that the nations might tremble at your presence. So tear through the mess, O Lord, and come down to us again. We long to be your people, a people of hope. We light this first candle as a sign of our hope. Hope that you can meet us, even in the mess of our world. Hope that you still see us. Though we feel we are lost in the rubble, let this light be the guide that brings us to Emmanuel once more. A reading from Isaiah 64, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you are angry and we sinned, because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you have promised to be with us no matter what difficult circumstances invade our lives. 
we lift up our many brothers and sisters in Christ who are facing increasingly hard times. Hear them now as we call out their names. Lord, hear our prayers. God, we are watching and waiting for the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ and join with the Spirit in praying, come, Lord Jesus. In these increasingly difficult times, we ask for your strength and courage to face whatever lies ahead, knowing that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall re be revealed in us, and that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Whom priests and prophets long foretold And break the chains that bind us Redeem your long lost gold Come Messiah Dispel our night with dawn of grace Come Messiah We long to see your book of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. The word of God for you and for me on this Sunday morning, may we take these words into our heart and covenant together to live our lives out of what they say. There's never been a time in my life where we've needed the message of Advent more than we do right now. We're tired. We're frustrated, we're bored, we're anxious, we're antsy, we're scared. We've had enough. We can't take any more. We don't know what to believe. We can't understand our neighbor. We can't watch the news. We can't look away from the news. We need hope. Some of us found it in the election. Some of us lost it in the election. We need hope. Now more than ever, if we're going to cope with our circumstances until this pandemic is over and we discover what society will be like on the other side. I think hoping and coping have something to do with each other. For me, I've been able to cope with all these changes by reigniting my passion for music. You may be wondering when I lost it since, after all, I am the music minister here. Well, I wouldn't say exactly that I lost it. It just took a break for a little while when the kids were born. I used to spend several hours a day playing one or more of the 17 instruments that I know how to use. When the kids came along, I would sometimes go weeks without playing anything, especially when I was still a teacher. But the pandemic left me with such anxiety, especially at the beginning, that I needed a distraction, an escape. And so after the kids would go to sleep, I began channeling what energy I had left into music. It started with learning hymns on the guitar that I could share with you. I began learning at a faster pace than I ever have in my life. I learned so much that I wanted to share some of it with the world. 
So I even started a little YouTube channel to maybe help someone else learn what I've learned. If we can't hope, we can at least cope. And sometimes that leads to something that points us toward hope, as long as it's a healthy coping mechanism. So what are you doing to stay sane in a healthy way right now? I heard a beautiful piece on on Facebook by Kitty O'Mara, and it, it goes like this. And the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still and listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows, and the people began to think differently. And the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. There's a connection between hoping and healing. There's something about staring into the face of uncertainty and choosing to hope against all odds that holds you together and keeps life from falling apart. Emily Dickinson says, hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. You know, I think it's there. It's always there, singing and bringing light to our darkness. But sometimes we listen to the noise instead of the music. So how do we tune into the music of hope that God has built into the universe it's not easy, it's complicated, and it's different for each one of us. I think there's a bit that we can learn from the biblical perspective. The first thing the Bible tells us about hope is that we don't have to ignore the chaos around us. In fact, it encourages us to acknowledge the darkness of this world and bring our complaints, our prayers, and petitions our concerns and worries and anxieties to God. It's called lament. We even have a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations, and at least 42 psalms are considered psalms of lament. Commentator Jerome Creech calls this passage from Isaiah that was read earlier a community of lament, a prayer for help that the community offered in worship. Such prayers include a mix of complaint, petition, and trust. They rehearse what God has done in the past in order to make the suffering of the community an issue of the Lord's sovereignty in the world. Biblical hope meets us in the present by reminding us what God has done in the past, and it fills us with anticipation or what God might yet do in the future. We see in little refrains throughout scripture, you'll hear God called the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. This was a way of recalling how God saw each one of these men through their troubles and met them in the midst of their suffering. Or you might hear the God who brought you out of Egypt. This was a way of reminding the Israelites of God's redeeming them, bringing them out of slavery. We too need these reminders. We need to rehearse what God has done in order to have hope about what God might do, especially when we're in the midst of crisis. Hope was born for times like these. God's people have a long history of crisis leading unbelievers to ask the question, how can you believe in a good God who would let these things happen to you? But the believer says, I don't know how I could have made it through those things without God walking with me. 
The crisis in Isaiah's day was great, greater even than our current pandemic crisis, in that their nation had been invaded, not by a plague or a virus, but by the invading Babylonian army of King Nebuchadnezzar, who destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and blinded King Zedekiah so that the last thing he saw would be the execution of his two sons. Nebuchadnezzar then took many of the surviving citizens of Jerusalem back to Babylon with him, where they would live for nearly 50 years as sojourners in a foreign land with the future of their politics, their religion, and their very lives in question. How do you speak hope in a time such as this? That was the task of Isaiah, the prophet, God's press secretary of the day. How do you convince people that God is still God when the city and God's temple were destroyed? How do you convince people that God is on their side when the enemy has has the power to take everything you own and cart you off into slavery? Where is hope in this? Where is God in this? I'm not sure everyone bought Isaiah's message. I'm sure there were plenty who lost all hope and gave up on God altogether. And if you think about it, can you really blame them under those circumstances? But those who managed to hold on to hope did this. They told their story and they told God's story. They turned to scripture, at least as much as they had in those days. The Torah, the the books of Moses, And they added to it. We get the shape of our Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. We get the shape of that from this time. They edited things. They wanted to emphasize others. They added to what they already had. But it was significant. It spoke to them during that crisis. Uh, They didn't have the temple. It had been destroyed. And so they gathered together and found this new focus on Scripture. And it played a big part of their identity. They voiced their laments. They found a way to praise God in the middle of this in spite of everything that had happened to them. So with the future in question, they weren't sure if they would be around to tell their story to future generations And so this focus on scripture that they had caused them to write everything down. Many of their stories had only been told uh, by word of mouth for generation to generation. And so they had to edit what stories they had and write down the ones that they hadn't written uh, in order to preserve their identity for future generations. With no temple in which to worship God, they focused all their energy on God's story. And this made their story, God's story was a central part of their identity and a foundation for their hope. The hope that God would eventually come through and act on their behalf. That God would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake and your presence as when the fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. Now, they thought all the bad things had happened to them because they had sinned. And they said things like this, For you have hidden your face from us, God, and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. In a way, this was true. But not so much for the sins of all the common people as for the consequences of King Zedekiah choosing to ignore his advisors and rebel against the Babylonian Empire. Actions have consequences. And unfortunately, those at the bottom suffer from the consequences of those at the top. But even though they thought all the suffering was their own fault, they still had hope, saying, Yet, O Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. 
Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider we are all your people. You see, they held on to their identity as God's people, as God's agents for good in the world. And so should we. To lose your identity is to lose hope. And to lose hope is to lose your identity. Some people have described depression as feeling like a stranger living inside yourself. So in order to have hope, we must cling tightly to who we are. We must tell our stories and remind ourselves of what we're made of, what we've accomplished and what we've made it through. In a song I'm writing about the pandemic, I chose these words. We are more than what we've lost. We are more than what we have left. We are more. You see, we're more than our struggles. We're more than our anxieties. We're more than our depression. We're more than our frustrations and our impatience. We are more than what we've become in 2020. And we need to be reminded of it or we'll start to lose hope. If we're not worth more than the sum of all our mistakes and troubles, then why would Christ have come to redeem this world? Into the chaos of this dark world, hope was born. And the world barely noticed. A few wise men and shepherds, perhaps. But hope was born. And we must not forget it. We must relive this story in this season of Advent and be reborn ourselves as we make it a part of our identity like we never have before. That's how we rekindle hope in the middle of crisis. We tell God's story, our story. I believed in the, the power of story so much that I became an English teacher for nine years. I love some of the stories I got to share with my classes, though the feeling was not always mutual. My students used to get particularly frustrated reading Ernest Hemingway's classic, The Old Man and the Sea. You may remember that the old man has to leave his apprentice behind because the boy's parents sent him with a younger, more lucky boat. So 90% of the book is true to its title, just The Old Man and the Sea. You may remember how it starts. He was an old man who fished alone in a skiff in the Gulf Stream, and he had gone 84 days now without taking a fish. In the first 40 days, a boy had been with him, but after 40 days without a fish, the boy's parents had told him that the old man was now definitely and finally Salau, which is the worst form of unlucky, and the boy had gone at their orders in another boat, which had caught three good fish the first week. It made the boy sad to see the old man come in each day with his skiff empty, and he always went down to help him carry either the coiled lines or the gaff and harpoon and the sail that was furled around the mast. The sail was patched with flour sacks and furled. It looked like the flag of permanent defeat. You may remember the old man's three-day struggle with an 18-foot blue marlin, scars in his hands and his respect for the beast that he must kill in order to make a living. But I bet you can't forget the fact that the sharks consume the entire body of the fish on the ride home. And the old man returns with just a skeleton of what remains of the greatest achievement in his lifetime. My students hated that part. Mr. Bishop, you mean he went through all of that for nothing? They thought it was the worst book in the world. But I saw something different. I saw human resilience in its most brilliant form. The old man went 84 days with nothing. He fought for his life for three days, and he ended up with nothing to show for it. But the book closes, not with the flag of permanent defeat, but with the old man and his apprentice dreaming up new schemes for catching more fish and fighting off the sharks better this time. In all of his struggles, he never gave up. He held on to one shred of hope that kept him going. And so must we. For as the old man says, 
Man is not made for defeat. A man can be destroyed, but not defeated. Through Christ. Amen. Hear now this benediction from our sister denomination, the, the PC USA, and their declaration of faith from 1991. Hope in God gives us courage for the struggle. The people of God have often misused God's promises as excuses for doing nothing about present evils. But in Christ, the new world has already broken in. And the old can no longer be tolerated. We know our efforts cannot bring in God's kingdom, but hope plunges us into the struggle for victories over evil that are now possible in the world, the church, and our individual lives. Hope gives us courage and energy to contend against all opposition, however invincible it may seem, for the new world and the new humanity that are surely coming. Jesus is Lord. He has been Lord from the beginning. He will be Lord at the end. Even now, he is Lord. Amen.